Hello everyone. This is Marianne with the Sustainable Living podcast. I'm so pleased you're tuning in to us today. Today we have what I think is a super exciting show. We are bringing you two new voices which are going to be very regular features on the Sustainable Living podcast. I'm really really stoked to bring those two beautiful women and their voices to you. Both of them have different aspects and different views on life and I think it will really enrich what we are doing here. But before we do that, I want to give a big big shout out to our newest Patreon supporters. We have Lisa Davis. <laughs> Thank you so much. It helps us so much to finance our show with your guys' support. Thank you, Lisa. And we also have Forest Creek Meadows. Big shout out. Thank you so much. The next show, we will read out all of our supporters because we so, so much appreciate you. And that's patreon.com. If you want to support us, you can get there from our website. Now, let me tell you about Pia, who is going to be the first segment today. Pia was living in San Diego when we met, and she had done a week-long climate change conference. And it was mostly about what kind of action steps can we do as individuals to change. It's about education. It's about engaging community and make us all excited about actually doing those steps which might seem difficult. Pia has since moved to Minneapolis, and she has started her own podcast, <laughs> which is so cool. And I actually was a guest on her podcast. In the show notes, I'm linking to said episode. But what's even cooler is that Pia is going to be a regular on our show, and she's going to do a segment on sustainable travel. And I think many, many, many of us have been in such situations that we are pretty good about, you know, not having too much plastic in our life and uh, recycling everything and having our own containers when we are at home. But it's a lot harder sometimes to do that when we are traveling. So many choices, uh, which... At home, it seems like second nature, but when we are somewhere else, it might take a little bit more thinking about it. And so Pia is going to have a regular segment and kind of helping us out to make those choices in an easier way. So without further ado, here is Pia. Hi, everyone. I'm Pia, a new monthly correspondent for the Sustainable Living Podcast. My monthly segment will revolve around sustainable travel. I've thought a lot about sustainable travel over the years. A big passion of mine is exploring, and as a greenie, I also try to be very mindful about what I choose to do. Travel is one of the biggest contributors to our climate issues, but most of us still do it, whether for work, pleasure, or things like visiting family. Through my monthly podcast segment, I'll be focusing on sustainable travel, both at home and in our travels. In this month's segment, learn more about my favorite sustainable travel option, bike share programs. She gets on her banana bike and pedals all around. She gets on her banana bike and travels to the town. There's just no stopping her, this is for sure. She gets on her banana bike and pedals more and more. Bike share programs are amazing. The first use of bike share bikes was in 1965. A group of activists in Amsterdam painted some bikes white and left them for everyone to use freely. Though this first program was unsuccessful, it did spark an idea. Now, there are roughly 1,000 bike share programs around the world, with more than a million bikes in rotation. Bike share programs are basically a super convenient and much cheaper bike rental option. You can find a station or a bike, rent it for a short period of time, then return it. It's that simple. If you haven't used one, my goal for this episode is to get you excited to try one as soon as possible. They're fun, convenient, and you get some calories burning too. To learn more about bike shares, I reached out to my local bike share program in the Twin Cities, Nice Ride, Minnesota. I'm Michelle Molstead. I work in the marketing department doing outreach and group memberships and events. Michelle was nice enough to invite me to the Nice Ride headquarters in Minneapolis. 
I definitely geeked out over the office since I'm a huge fan, but kept my cool to learn more about the program. Nice Ride Minnesota is one of the oldest bike shares in North America. Uh, we're a nonprofit, which is a little unusual. We have currently about 1,800 bikes and 200 stations throughout the Twin Cities. Bike ride programs are so wonderful because they give you access to a city in a way you don't have otherwise. I think that there are places that you can go on a bike and particularly on a nice ride because you can be spontaneous about it. We have so many trails and so many lakes and creeks that are so much more fun to be explored when you're actually closer to them than when you're in, say, a car. Biking itself is the perfect way to explore while visiting a city or just getting around your own hometown because you have the ability to get around sometimes even faster and simpler than a car. Plus, you have access to a much wider range of the city than, say, by walking. Even thinking about a frequent trip I take to a local theater in Minneapolis. It takes 10 minutes by car, but then you have to find parking. It takes about 30 minutes walking, which isn't bad. But to bike, it takes me 12 minutes, and that's pretty convenient if you ask me. Michelle gave me some other great benefits of the bike share program. I tell people during the nice ride season, they have their own bikes plus 1,800 extra bikes and 1,800 bikes that come with a mechanic. I say it's a more social bike. Uh, you're sitting upright a little bit more. It's a lot easier to just ride along the trails, along the river with your friends and family. If you just want to lock it at a station, you can walk away and go get your ice cream cone. Just a lot of convenience and you can be really spontaneous. It's, it's a beautiful day and you didn't have your bike, but you're down at Minnehaha Falls and oh, hey, let's go, let's go ride a bike up and down the river, maybe down to Fort Snelling. Totally last minute stuff. And as far as traveling goes, biking becomes part of the memorable experience. We want to give people an opportunity to create memories for their visit in the Twin Cities. And when you're moving around the cities, you can create the memory by just moving around on a bike. So when you say you bike to the Twins game, when you bike to the St. Paul Saints game, you can bike to different breweries or restaurants. That's part of the journey itself, part of the trip. The first time I realized how great bike share programs were was when I was in Denver for a caffeine crawl a couple of years ago. The Caffeine Crawl is a tour that explores the local coffee scene in many cities around the U.S., and route options include driving, biking, and walking. I picked the bike route because I thought it would be fun, and I knew Denver had a pretty convenient bike share program. It was a blast. About half the group used the bike share program and the rest had their own bikes, and we had so much fun. We laughed, struggled for directions, and burned off our caffeine from the many coffee pit stops. It was one of the most memorable travel experiences of my life, and mostly because the bike share program was such a fun way to explore and become one with my travels. Michelle shared a travel experience where she used a bike share program too. Last year, I was in Montreal for a bike share conference. And as a traveler, it was fun to feel like a local because so many locals use the bike share. And, and I just felt like I was part of the crowd when I would pull up and dock my bike and then go get a really tasty bagel or a great cup of coffee. I think a big part of sustainable travel is taking advantage of what we have in our own communities and doing more local and regional exploring. So many of us have a bike share program in our own city, but have you used it yet? Michelle had an excellent idea of how to use your bike share program. I moved here from Vancouver, Washington four years ago, and I brought a suitcase and one of my bikes. And I found out there was a bike share station a block from my apartment. And it was a lot easier to rent a nice ride than to haul my bike up three flights of stairs. And so I started using the nice rides and it really became a, a little challenge to visit as many stations as I could when I was going places around the city. And I got to know both Minneapolis and St. Paul really well just from trying to find the nice ride stations. Are you ready to give your bike share program a spin? If you've never used one, it may seem intimidating at first, but it doesn't have to be. Find out your bike share program either at home or on the road and download the app. Most of them have one and it's indispensable. You'll be able to find stations, look up routes, and pay with it. If you don't want to commit to the app, don't worry. Find info on the program website and follow the directions once you get to the station. Bike share companies do their best to make it as easy as possible on their riders. I urge you to use one this weekend for an adventure. Plan out a route to a new coffee shop, use to get to the baseball game, or meet up with friends and make an afternoon out of it. On your next trip, look up the bike share option. You'll experience your destination in such a more meaningful way. Plus, it'll give you greater access to tourist stops, outdoor adventures, and good times. Not to mention you'll feel energized because you'll be living like a local. 
I'm going to leave the final words to Michelle. When I talk with people who haven't been on a bike in a long time, and then they get on the bike and they'll come back and they'll say, I feel like a kid again. And I think that's something that Bike Share helps facilitate is this idea that you can do something really practical, like get around a city and still have a real exhilaration about the process. Thank you so much for listening. Special thank you to the Sustainable Living Podcast for giving me a voice as a monthly correspondent. And thank you to Michelle in Nice Ride, Minnesota for being so awesome. Enjoy exploring this month. Now let me introduce you to Claire. Claire I met on said social media platform I have been talking about called Steam It, and she is known as Fishy Culture. And we started talking about homesteading and permaculture courses. With time, we have become friends, and I seen some videos Claire did and some other things I really liked. So I asked her if she would be interested in sharing her perspective because she lives out in Sabunis on 30 acres with five cows. And she came to this whole permaculture and homesteading thing much later in life. Claire is going to share how it feels like to be a homesteader when you start, when you're past 40, <laughs> I think you will enjoy Claire's take on life. And she's definitely going to bring a different perspective from somebody who is just starting out and maybe is an 18-year-old <laughs> young person getting started in the permaculture farming journey. So Claire is also a grandma. That's something we have in common. Without further ado, here is Claire. Hello, hello. I am Fishy Culture on Steam It, a mama must on YouTube, and Claire, if you bump into me in the street, welcome to my first podcast. Thank you for hitting that play button. I will try to make it worth your effort. Let me start with my disclaimer. I am here to share what I know and what I believe. I'm happy to discuss these things, but I'm not interested in fighting. If you believe something different, fine, I can agree to disagree. If you want to get disagreeable, I'm going to walk away. Okay, I want to dive into a topic that affects every living human, eating. That's a very broad topic, so I'll try to dish it up in bite-sized pieces. Let's nibble on the notion of growing our own food first. I put in a 9-to-5 career in healthcare. Then had a prescription drug reaction nearly kill me and forced me into retirement in my late 40s. For a variety of reasons, uh, key among them was the need to eliminate preservatives and artificial colors and flavors and the residual pesticides and herbicides from my diet. So I started to grow our own food. Not just a little lettuce patch, I wanted to control as much of our food supply as possible. I did not just have chickens to lay eggs, I also raised meat birds. I did not just go buy a sack of chicken food. I grew my own chicken food, too. Barley sprouts. Now, I also gave them ground-dry food. I have a local non-GMO supplier of chicken feed for laying hens. But each year when it came time for the meat birds, I grew that, too. I bought organic corn, wheat, barley, fish meal, kelp, Redmond minerals, made my own little recipes, and knew exactly what they had. It, I want to know what my food's eating, so I made dinner for my dinner. Years and years I did that. I also cut the cost of feeding the chickens to the bone. My burns were, birds were getting fresh ground organic feed for less than I could buy the cheap GMO stuff, at least here in town. But I still could not make a profit selling the chickens. We ate well. We always had a chicken to give as a gift when I wanted to. But I lost money trying to sell them. Now, I covered my costs, but the months of intensive labor that I put in was being done for free, so I stopped selling them. I couldn't even call them organic anyway. I would have had to incur more cost to get that certification. And the people in my local market don't really care so much about an organic label. They want to know the farmer, which is a better way to go, honestly. That label is not 100% trustworthy. And pretty much half the people in this county grow chickens now anyway. So 
just no money to be made selling the chickens or the eggs. Now, I had a similar experience with my cow. I got myself a little bottle baby Holstein many years ago. At the time I bought her, there was no place around to buy raw milk. By the time she grew up and had a calf, I could buy raw milk in local stores. So, you know, those of you who think that nothing's getting better, things really are changing. I went ahead and I milked their, my cow that first year, but after that I just let her calf have it. Again, with my time being worth something. At least to me it is. <laughs> At this point, I can run 15 minutes down the road, get fresh raw milk for $5 a gallon. We don't even drink the whole gallon in the week. I skim the coffee off for, or the cream off for my coffee. I make cheese with whatever we don't. So we're getting cheese, delicious pure cream for my coffee, and milk when we want it for $5 a week. I cannot milk a cow fast enough to cut that cost, so I quit. This year, I finally had this come-to-Jesus moment with it all. Came time to butcher the chickens, and everyone dumped the chore on me. Feeding the cute birds and gathering eggs, that's all good and fun, but someone's got to clean the eggs, someone's got to clean the coop, someone's got to take the birds to the butcher, and somehow I ended up with all the dirty work. And not maliciously, my husband had to work, you know. The, it, it, but so I quit. It, it was insane. My poor husband was going to work, busting his ass, and watching his hard-earned money go down the gullet of chickens who were so old they had not laid an egg in years. We were running a retirement home for chickens, and it was far from cost-effective. And they weren't, like I say, even laying eggs. So it's not like they were even supplying food to us at that point. They were dying of old age. We were hauling those carcasses to the dump one by one. That, to me, is a waste of a life. So, I rounded up the old girls. They're in the freezer now. And then, plus, I start looking at my coops to do the meat birds. I've got my pasture penning coops out there. They're starting to fall apart. So, to do meat birds this year, I would have had to spend more money to upgrade those coops. And we're already losing money on these meat birds, right? And I still have enough chicken in my freezer to last another year. So, no meat birds this year. I quit. Chickens laying hens, gone. Meat birds, gone. For the first time in over 10 years, I do not have to jump up out of the middle of a barbecue to go feed chickens. I do not have a rooster squawking at me at the break of dawn or chasing my grandchildren around the yard. I don't have chicken poop everywhere. The meat birds were past your pen, but the hens ran free. Frankly, it grossed me out. I like free-range hens, but in an enclosed area. But up here, they were open range, which means chicken poop everywhere, including my front step. I never had the time and money to fence them out of the yard here. We were too busy trying to keep the cows fenced in and this old house standing up. Failing at that, too. But by getting rid of the chickens, we can focus on getting the cow pastures hardened off. And this old house is just as good as it's going to get. Quitting things that sucked our time, money, and energy has been incredibly uplifting. I literally feel lighter. <laughs> and we will do what we should have done 10 years ago. We're going to focus on building our infrastructure. We have experimented with so many food growing projects. Aquaponics is really the big answer to feeding humanity, in my opinion. We have a dome that was constructed with the intent of putting an aquaponics system inside. That project has been on hold for years now. It's getting some time and attention this summer. Even my garden has been a dismal failure since we moved here. Last year everything was doing beautifully. Then a grasshopper plague came to town and I got to harvest almost nothing. They even ate my onions. Before that it was voles. They killed a hundred little fruit trees that I had planted and hand watered and loved on for weeks and weeks and weeks. When they f killed the first few of them, I got looking into, you know, how do I stop this? And I discovered this Sepp Holzer bone sauce stuff. That it's, you, you dig this sand pit and you have to have a cast iron uh, touch oven and you boil bones till they're down to this just vile smelling stuff. And you paint it on the trunks of your little saplings. And it stopped them. They quit. They were eating rings around the trunks, the little trunks of these baby trees. And the bone sauce did make them stop eating the trunks. The little buggers would bear, dig underground and eat them off at the roots instead. They killed every one of them, 100 little saplings. That kind of aggravation just was wearing on me. And it wasn't just the animals. The wind here beats down anything that tries to stand up. Tomatoes, peppers, corn, whatever. 
and the birds will also get into the strawberries if you're not out there at the crack of dawn. You know, if you want to sleep in one day during strawberry season, you might as well know that the birds ate all your berries that day. And around here, it hardly ever rains all summer long. But when it does, it's a beatdown. And so I'm just as tired of battling the elements and the wildlife for my food as I am of chicken poop on every pair of shoes I own. So I quit. I'm getting good at quitting this spring, and it's wonderful. No garden this year. The raised beds that I had are crumbling, and they were only a foot high to begin with, meaning I still had to stoop over to plant, weed, and harvest. And I am too old, and I'm only getting older, for that kind of mistreatment of my back. Now, when we made... The decision to get into farming, one of the reasons was prepping. I do believe in climate change. I do not believe in anthropogenic global warming, and I'm not interested in fighting about it. Feel free to agree or disagree. Just don't get disagreeable with me, right? That's the deal. (laughs) I have not lied to you either way. I'm giving my opinion based on my deep research. I suspect an ice age is a far more real threat than global warming. But either way, we need new ways to feed people going into the future. The old you know, monocropping and, you know, the the corporate agriculture is not a long-term answer. So anyway, this was all about 10 years ago. And at the time, I did not know anyone with chickens or cows or a garden. It was important to me that I be able to feed lots of people, not just us. If a volcano blew up, I do live near Yellowstone. If a major earthquake struck, there is a fault about two miles from me or even a major blizzard or storm, would have left many of my neighbors without food. So I always kept an eye on trying to have enough food to feed my entire community and to make that sustainable, not just one meal. I prepped to get an entire community through an emergency. Chickens will lay eggs for a long time, just and you don't even have to have chicken feed. They can get out and scratch on their own as long as it's not the dead of winter. Dairy cow can pump out thousands of high-quality calories per day, again, just out grazing on a pasture. Beef cattle can take this scrub desert and turn it into meat. Well, the vegans started to attack me and call me immoral for growing meat. Frankly, it made me want to smack them upside the head, and I do not believe violence is an answer to anything. (laughs) But I'm human. And such short-sightedness, it's going to leave a lot of dig dead vegans to bury if we ever have a big disaster here. I mean, I'm sorry. I tried to grow some plants to feed them, but apparently they're too moral to eat what I can actually grow around here, so feel free to starve and feel morally superior for it. Um, By the way, that leaf you ate, you killed it. You might have left the rest of the plant alive, but that leaf, you killed it. You need to get your brain around one simple truth, and it really will make you a better person. We kill to live. That is the sacred cycle. It's not really a bummer, because without death, life's not very special. So, The accusation that I am immoral for growing what I can grow to feed people, lots of people, in a dire emergency, I just, let me just say, arrogance and ignorance is not a pretty combination. Now, moving on. And that's enough about what I was doing and why I quit that. (laughs) Let's talk a little about what I'm going to do moving forward. I'm going to strictly indoor food production. I will utilize fertilized gardens to eliminate as much of that bending over as I can. I will spend this summer getting infrastructure built to grow microgreens this winter. My husband and I have gone to a ketogenic diet now. We have plenty of meat in our freezer. If I grow salads through the winter, we will have a very small grocery bill, and I'm still not going to be eating the poisons in the standard food supply. And here's the best part. I will do other things, like work with Marianne West on podcasts to help others who might be falling out of love with the self-reliance lifestyle, and take a vacation and visit friends and family, take an overnight getaway. Things we've been almost completely unable to do for 10 years. Even when someone watches the animals for us, it's never relaxing being away. Anyone with animals knows what I mean. You just fret about them the whole time you're gone. So as we find ourselves getting older and achier and maybe crankier, we're looking to find that balance between being prepared for emergencies and going ahead and enjoying all those days where no emergency happened. I hope you'll follow along on this leg of our journey. My husband will occasionally join me when he's able. He's never done a podcast either, so watch for his big debut. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much to Marianne West for being ever so patient with me as I learned how to put this little segment together. And thank you to the universe for this amazing gift I call my life. Don't forget to let your light shine. I will see you next time. Namaste. (laughs) 
I hope you enjoyed meeting Claire and Pia as much as I enjoyed listening to them. Give us your feedback. Let us know. Email at sustainablelivingpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Instagram, uh, Twitter not so much, <laughs> and on steamit.com. Email is probably the very best way to get a hold of me very quickly. Thank you so much for listening. And if you feel like supporting us on Patreon, we would love it. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye for now. Bye.